Okay, so uh, we're here at the final of the of the four. I mentioned last week, I think in the future, I'm gonna start doing batches of six, which the program once did lean on um, once upon a time. Um, but this is still, we're still in the land of four. The Opatria Mia, uh, the building of new nation states, and not just new nation states, but nation states on what will emerge as the modern model, uh, the full technocratic nation states that, that we're familiar with. Uh, jumping in, I, I'm also going to have a section on the development of social science towards uh, the end of this lecture. But jumping in, where I want to begin is we had left off talking about English industrialization. And the um, I was asked at the end of last week after the session, someone said, why England so much? And I just said, because they were such an early case and a special case, and that their quick development precipitated other nations joining the game, but having to use different tactics to play, as they say, catch up ball. So on the continent, uh, economic development was very nationalistic in spirit and style. In fact, without government support, there is reason to believe that the French and the Germans in particular would not have been able uh, to get into the game, uh, they were so far behind the English that being able to compete with English prices for manufactured goods would have really put them at a disadvantage. So in France and in Germany, there were protective tariffs, tariffs as early as the 1840s. And it was to combat cheap English goods from completely dominating world markets. In uh, Germany, there was the development of the so-called Zollverein, the United Toll uh, Assembly of, of small German states under the guidance of a German nationalist called Friedrich List. Uh, there was a, an agreement to buy freely from each other, almost like the EU model now, to buy freely from each other, but to tax goods coming in from outside. And then I have this little quote from Friedrich List here. The British free trade system is an attempt to make the rest of the world like the Hindus, it serfs in all industrial and commercial relations. If we look at this map on the right, let me make it larger. Uh, the so-called golden triangle, this was the area of heaviest um, industrial development, really from the Ruhr Valley in Germany all the way to the southeast of England. Uh, and the, 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 the brown patches are the key industrial areas. You'll, by 1850, you notice the way these bands are dated. By 1850, arguably, uh, it was England and just the beginnings of the leap off into France and Germany. By 1870, there was this heavy band that included uh, certainly the upper northern half of France and, and most of what we would have called 40 years ago, West Germany, hadn't quite fully reached uh, Prussia and the East, but, th but these areas that were famous for steel mills and coal mining and the like uh, were well underway by 1870. And indeed, it isn't until 1914 that you see areas in Northeastern Italy and Bohemia and Silesia and the Ukraine and, and, and uh, Russia begin to develop heavy industrialization which meant that there were areas that were 60, 70 years behind the English. 
the English had that early jump as early as 1760 to get uh, at least textile development underway. But the heavy lifting, uh, railways and the coal mining and iron smelting that went hand in hand with, uh, with the railways was of a pace in, by mid-century. So governments underwrote railway and road construction in France, Belgium, and Germany. At the same time, corporate banks, uh, which were able to exist because of laws, laws that had been in place in England early on in the 18th century, laws that uh, guaranteed limited liability so that if you open the bank, the principles of the bank who put their money in to get the thing rolling were not privately exposed if there was a run in the bank or if, or if the bank indeed went under. So the individual liability of the board and the, the capitalists who were investing in the enterprise uh, was limited. And this, what this meant was that you had banks and they could lend. Because without credit, this great interdependent you know, octopus of economic development where, where you took profits from one business and you were investing in other businesses, and then the employees of the new businesses were able to buy the products of the old businesses, and you the ferment that indeed uh, became a critical mass so that economies just grew under, they matured and they grew under their, their, their own impetus and did not need external stimulation. If you could use government-sponsored investment to start that ball rolling, at some point the, the, the private uh, corporations would spring up around government sponsorship of credit and access to credit and, and be able to compete on their own. So what do we have? By 1848, the economic gap with England at least begins to close in Western Europe, even though I had this caveat in that first bottom bullet in the box there, extensive rural regions remain in Eastern Europe. There was still uh, rudiments of serfdom if you get into, uh, into Russia and, and some of its vassal states in this period. There was a strong governmental presence in the economy and, and this governmental presence uh, presages the modern nation state model. There isn't a country in the world, including the United States in the 21st century, uh, despite its vaunted uh, private enterprise system that doesn't heavily dabble in government investment. Uh, we see the amounts, the, the billions, the last three years that have been poured into agribusiness in the United States, for instance, uh, without which uh, agriculture, not just small farm agriculture, but a lot of large scale commercial agriculture would have gone under uh, in the corn belt and the soybean belt. Uh, so the red arrows on that map show the the direction of development as populations began to uh, jump on the bandwagon of industrial development uh, as goosed on by the, the nation states that they belong to. 1848 is something of a magical year. It is the year of revolution. It is the year that the veterans of 1789 and 1830 imagined was eventually going to take place and the hopes of revolutionaries all over Europe uh, in the 1840s was that when it finally broke open, this was going to be it. There were gonna be constitutional revolutions. There were going to be uh, 
ethnicities breaking away and forming new nation states. There were going to be worker uprisings. So, so the hopes went. And indeed, it was often referred to 1848 as the as the spring of nations, just as some years back in our own period, we saw the, the so-called Arab Spring using, using the same metaphor. 1848 turned out to be something of a bourgeois revolution, uh, by which I mean, it was led by educated elites, students, soldiers, journalists, we refer to the the so-called, the, using the German term, the Mittelstand, this, this high-end educated middle class that, that directed the social uh, ferment. But uh, it really didn't represent as a group, the leadership of uh, worker demands that people later on in the 1850s and 60s, as we talked about last week, uh, the people who would have attended the first international, it certainly didn't represent their interests. By 1848, urban worker representation had spiked in France and Germany, even though it was still, um, if you will, not at the level of a revolutionary fever. There was still a lot of peasantry and peasant serfdom in Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And as we've mentioned, in passing, in other uh, class sessions, peasantry in this period tended to be rather conservative, rather traditionalist, and, and without much appetite for revolution. So there was limited worker support for revolution in the more developed areas like France. This was why Karl Marx argued uh, that the revolts of 1848 largely ended in failure. Uh, they seem to promise a lot out of the gate. And as we will discuss in a few minutes, once the, uh, the threat of actual social revolution, which means as, as Marx and uh, the, the socialists had pointed out, an attack on private property, those people who were interested in constitutional political reform, democratic reforms, were suddenly uh, spokespeople for law and order and were uh, turning into reactionaries on the spot as soon as the, uh, the heat was turned up. So I mention here that uh, liberal and democratic reform goals were really what motivated this Mittelstaan group. So things like freedom of the press, demands for political representation. Uh, oh, I mentioned freedom of the press twice. I had a different bullet in there uh, originally. Sorry about that. Uh, but, but this kind of liberal expansion of the electorate, uh, was really what student activists, journalists were most interested in. There were some places in which you could go very far with nationalist goals in terms of, of fomenting uprising. So political independence meant in some places creating new independent nation states, which the proponents would have argued was the natural state of things. In other words, they would have said, here you have a natural ethnicity uh, like the Hungarians, but they are embedded in this polyglot Austro-Hungarian empire where their independence is being suppressed and repressed. And since the 1830s, a lot of young nationalists, uh, student groups and the like, calling themselves, they often had young in the title, uh, appeared in countries all around Europe. So in Italy, you had, you had young Italy, La Giovine Italia. You had Jungest Deutschland. You had Meloda Polska. You had groups that said, we want independence from whatever dominant 
overlord has been keeping us from our ethnic destiny. So, so this is the age where in Italy, the bel canto opera tradition often, often was about waving tricolor flags and liberating the Milanese from the Austrians or Germans who wanted to be liberated from Austro-Hungary, and in some cases from Prussia, in some cases to Prussia, and Poles wanted to be liberated uh, from both Prussia and Russia, depending which side of the grand divide you were on. So the primary motive in cases where an ethnic group, which was usually defined by language, as I've said in the past, was dominated by another ethnic group, as was the case in the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian Empire. So Northern Italians, Czechs, Hungarians. Uh, from the great Hungarian national poem that was published in the 1840s by uh, Sandor Petofi. I, I never know how to pronounce Hungarian names. We swear by the God of the Hungarians, we swear we shall be slaves no more. Uh, what was the outcome of 1848 and all these uprisings? Well, there were some minor and limited successes. The Second Republic was declared in France, shortly overthrown by uh, Louis Napoleon, uh, but it had its moment in the sun. You had the abolition of formal serfdom in Austro-Hungary and, and uh, Prince Metternich was forced to resign. Finally, the, uh, the arch reactionary, the revolutionaries really wanted to unseat him from, from, from the uh, premiership of, of the empire. You developed a democracy of sorts in the Netherlands and the end of absolute monarchy, you had the invention of a constitutional monarchy in Denmark in this period. So some moderate gains on the bourgeois front, on the liberal and democratic reform front, but by far not the sort of overthrowing of the old order that the more radical groups uh, were hungering for in 1848. But 1848 left a taste in everyone's mouth for what was going to follow in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. Whoop. So a map of where outbreaks occurred, all these little red blotches are uprisings, political to the barricades uprisings. And, and th this little symbol you'll see in places on the map is where, where ethnic groups were at war. But you can see this by just by the list of cities, Palermo, Paris, Baden, Munich, Vienna, Buda, Berlin, Milan. It was, it was everywhere. And if I expand the map a little bit, you see how a tremendous number of these outbreaks occurred in areas that were the old Holy Roman Empire, okay, the German states here, and, and including areas that were within Prussia. There's Paris over here, there's Rome down here, but other outbreaks on the uh, inside of and on the borders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Palermo, because the kingdom of the two Sicilies uh, was southern Italy and Sicily, and they certainly uh, were ripe for political uprising in this very conservative part of the world. So this is the so-called Spring of Nations of 1848. And, and it, it began to draw the line between what would emerge in the later 19th century and into the 20th century and into the 21st century as the outlines of modern 
conservatism and modern liberalism as we now understand it, the battle lines began to form around demands for expanded representation and constitutional reform and, and, and a conservative resistance that was arguing as early as 1848, whenever a demand was being made for uh, an expanded electorate or anything of that ilk, it's socialism. We're hearing it in the election of 2020. You would have heard it in 1848 as well. Uh, some visuals for our delectation. And the reason I put all of these on the screen at the same time is just because they're also similar. You would have been able to find a thousand art representations with tricolor flags being waved with, with speeches being made, but basically with the streets being manned by people on the barricades. So we have, we have Paris in the battle at the Suflo barricades. We have this image from Poland of, of, of nobles being slaughtered by revolutionaries. We have the five days of Milan, the uprising against the Austrians with a tricolore in the background. We have uh, the Hungarian national poem being read to the revolutionaries at the barricades. We have tricolors in Berlin, in Prussia. We have tricolors in Vienna, the very seat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it was, an, if you will, an international sentiment that had stylistic, shared stylistic overtones everywhere. And the art in this period was on the subject, and the opera in the period was on the subject, and the poetry of the period was on the subject. This was uh, the spring of nations, uh, freedom in the air, liberation in the air, and, and it scared the hell out of uh, numbers of people in all of these places, as we shall see. And the first place that I want to look at uh, where it made a real change and formed a new nation or began to form a new nation is in Italy, the resurgence, the risorgimento. I want to spend a couple of slides talking about Italian unification. Uh, ah, so Peggy was asking, tricolors all seem red, white, and blue. Uh, if they were white, they're not all red, white, and blue. Uh, the, the French one was red, white, and blue because, the, uh, because they liked the American colors. And, and I'm not so sure what the symbols of the particular colors, but the Italian was red, white, and green. And we'll, and we'll see the German turns out to be, what is it, black, yellow, and red, I think. Um, so they do choose different colors. And I don't know why certain colors were used, whether they were symbols of uh, particular qualities, you know, like egalite is always blue or something. That I don't know. I'll, I'll take a peek. Next time I do the class, I hope I have an answer. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the story in Italy, and before, before we get any further, I just want to quickly look at the two maps. Whoop. And in the map in the upper right, what you can see is Italy in 1843. I picked a period on the brink of the revolutions. Basically, you had the Piedmont and, and Sardinia. Here's the Piedmont, here's the Sardinia, and Savoy as a, a separate kingdom. And by the way, you'll notice in this map that places that you now think of, and we'll talk about that, as part of France, like Nice, were part of Piedmont. They were Italian for centuries. This was Nizza. This was not 
a French holding, and Savoy was was a Piedmontese holding. You had the kingdom of Lombardy, Venezia, Lombardia and Venezia were controlled by the Austrians. The Tyrol up here, which is now part of Italy, the Sud Tyrol, anyhow, is now in the modern age is part of Italy. At the time, was was part directly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, and then you have these little. You have uh, the Duchy of Modena. Parma was a separate entity. The Grand Duchy of Tuscany. The Papal State states under the control of the Pope who had alliances with the French king in particular for special protection. The Pope always played every Catholic kingdom in Europe to its advantage so that it could call in outside influence when it needed it. But he had his own armies. Okay, so so what is now Lazio, what is now, here's Perugia, so it is now Umbria, and the Marche, here's Ancona, all the way up through the Romagna and into the bottom of what I think, way up here by Ferrara, is that, I guess that was the, still the Romagna back then. Anyhow, then you have in the south, uh, the kingdom of Naples and, the, and Sicily, known as the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Uh, all of southern Italy, which had been under French control, which had been under Spanish control, uh, heavily involved in papal politics and in Spanish politics, is an independent place. We'll take a look at the lower map, at which at the times as we get on, uh, as each of these pieces fell under the influence of what came to be a united Italy. Anyhow, going back to the bullets, between 1815 and 1830, now you had had Napoleonic occupation in Northern Italy and the reaction, uh, so seeds of unification and resistance to Austrian domination in the North. So the areas that had been under Napoleonic domination really with the Austrian reassertion of its control after the withdrawal of Napoleon's influence, they want to break away. They had a taste of, of being out of the hands and free from the control of the Austrians. And indeed, they have minor insurrections in places in the north, for instance, in the Piedmont, as early as 1821. In 1827, I mention only because it's so famous, uh, Alessandro Manzoni publishes I Promessi Sposi, uh, the, the betrothed. It's an allegorical critique of Austrian rule. It's considered the foundational novel of, of Italian uh, unification and nationalism. It's central to the creation of united, a unified, I should say, Italian language because it's written in a modern Tuscan that everyone then learns to read because it becomes the national book. And by the way, when Manzoni dies, uh, Verdi, who had written most of his Requiem already, it was already mainly intact, dedicates it to, and its first, um, its first performances were for Manzoni. It's, it's the Requiem for Italy, in effect. And it's the greatest of all the Requiems. If you've never heard the Verdi Requiem, do yourself a favor. It's probably the greatest piece of music I've ever heard. Anyhow, but that's that's my sales pitch for the, uh, my pre-election sales pitch. In uh, the South, in the kingdom of the two Sicilies, resistance to the Spanish was led by largely these Mittelstan groups, secret societies of students and journalists and intellectuals, the most famous being the Carbonari. Uh, any of you who have enjoyed spaghetti carbonara, it takes its name from the, the revolutionaries uh, who met at night with their little carbon torches. 
um, and and groups of young Italians, La Giovine Italia, under the authorship and leadership of Giuseppe Mazzini, the other great revolutionary of the early period, sponsoring Republican ideals. So nationalist uh, uh, movements and Republican movements uh, rife in Italy pre-1830 and through the 1830s. By 1848, I, I could not describe what, begin to describe without using the entire session, what happens in Italy in 1848. There are revolutions. There are republics declared. There are constitutions written. There are Austrian and French invasions. Um, I've saved my breath and just say by 1849, what we have is the Austrians having crushed the outbreaks in the North and, and uh, some semblance of pre-1848 normalcy having been returned to the boot. Um, I'll go, I'm gonna come back and talk about this a bit more in the next slide. From 1858 to 1860, a number of things happened. Nationalists cut a deal with France. Nationalists who realized that they could throw their interests in with the Piedmont, the kingdom of the Piedmont and Sardinia. They could throw their fortunes in with the Piedmont. So people who wanted an Italian nation state said, we'll throw our influence in with you. Uh, and, and in so doing, the Piedmont gets to cut a deal with France. They say, well, if you do, we'll cut a deal with the French. We'll give France Nice and Savoy, up, way up in that, in that northwestern corner of what was Italy at the time. And, and we'll do it in exchange they're dealing with Louis Napoleon at this point, will do it in exchange for military aid against Austria. The giving up of Nice so enrages Garibaldi, the great nationalist, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who we'll talk about in the next slide, that he um, almost threatens to turn the movement against the Piedmont but they managed to talk him into an invasion of the South. So the great, the great military expedition of Garibaldi and Emile, the thousand red shirts to attack Sicily and the kingdom of Naples uh, was made at the behest of the Piedmont just to get him out of their hair. Uh, the nationalist ally with the kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia under the leadership of Camillo Cavour, the great statesman of the Piedmont. The king is Victor Emmanuel, Vittorio Emanuele. And like many uh, people from Italian American families, I had an uncle Vic who was ultimately named because Victor Emmanuel was the name given to about a third of the sons of Southern Italy at the time. Uh, French and Piedmont victories lead to the annexation of Lombardy and parts of central Italy. Just parts, not the papal states yet. We'll go back and look at the map. And Garibaldi and Emile head for the south. Now, if I look at this map again, whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm sorry. I'm trying to blow this up. There we go. So if we look at this map, you'll see in 1858, the kingdom of Sardinia was just this dark purple. It adds in the period before 1860, this dark orange stuff, okay? And if you include uh, the successes that Garibaldi and allies were having in Southern Italy, you could claim that by 1860, 
uh, Italy began to, uh, the new kingdom of Italy began to annex this, and even part of the papal states, but that the Veneto doesn't get added until 1866, and this pinkish part of the papal states uh, really until 1870. And, and just to look at that later period, the end of this period for a second, what I call here La Forza del Destino, let's use all the, uh, the names of the Verdi operas if we can. Uh, and the final step in Italian unification from 1866 to 1870, uh, the Veneto is ceded to Italy under Prussian influence. Okay? And because Prussia is playing a large, uh, if you will, international game under the leadership of Bismarck, who we will get to very shortly. And Rome under French protection until the outbreak under the, uh, of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, when Prussia under Bismarck goes to war against uh, the Louis Napoleon and the French in 1870, Rome finally falls into Italian hands. And, and I'm specifically going to mention a very significant political player in the period uh, the Pope at the time, Pius IX, his little picture, uh, Pio Nono, he was a liberal, a reformer, until the outbreak of 1848, when in a classic example of the, the threat to authority and, and the threat of social revolution, so spooked him that he set the church in an absolute um, sort of dinosauric conservatism that was its political stance and its, its, if you will, theological stance all the way into the 20th century. If you, if you see uh, the Catholic Church as this kind of arch conservative institution, that character was probably set be, as a response to 1848 by Pius IX. And indeed, he sent Italy into its right, left, the struggle between right and left that Italy has had ever since, uh, in which you have, well, it's now begun to change again because of the new nationalists, but Italy throughout the 20th century was either the Communist Party or the so-called Christian Democrats um, and alliance with the, the mafia as the, the, the party of the right with almost nothing in between um, for much of the 20th century. Uh, little picture of the great man Garibaldi up on the right. Uh, and here he is leading an a, lithog a cartoon lithograph with you notice red, white, and green, not blue in this case, but a a tricolor leading the troops in the south. And this quote I have here from from one of the uh, the grand republicans from the period and constitutional reformers, Massimo D'Azeglio. We have made Italy, now we must make Italians. And the reason I mention this here is because one can, as opposed to uh, modern Germany, and even though modern Germany shares some of the problem, one can suggest that the way Italy came together in the 19th century uh, doomed it to be to being something of a failed nation. Uh, the unification was not Republican and, would, and was seen, it was, it was really monarchical, and it was seen in parts of Italy as an occupation by the North. The South in particular 
was strongly tied to Catholic traditions. And, and everywhere in Italy, but the South in particular, spoke a welter of dialects, dialects that were uh, decidedly not Tuscan. And, and I have to emphasize again, uh, dialects in Italy, this is true of languages all over Europe, uh, but I want to emphasize the degree to which it was true in Italy. Dialects were not accented versions of the same language. It is not, you know, Alabama trying to talk to Boston or, or Fargo, North Dakota. These were people speaking, for the most part, separate languages that may have had common root systems in, in Old Latin, but were under tremendous other outside influences, like in the South, Greek and Albanian um, and Spanish and French, for that matter, because of the occupations of, of, of Sicily and Naples. Uh, to the point that people often had trouble speaking to others from 20 or 30 or 40 miles away. And now it, it took until well into the 20th century to sort of arguably make the case that almost all Italians could speak proper Italian as well as their local dialect. Now the local dialects are suffering like crazy. Still spoken in many areas, uh, but the young probably live inside of uh, Tuscan Italian. Italian patriotism, even to this day, is often described as a campanilismo, from the church campaniles, you know, the towers, the bell tire, towers that each town would have, uh, to suggest that loyalty to the church tower in one's own hometown was your patria. That's, that's your home. You're a patriot to your own campanile, not, not to the nation. And here we have, since uh, nationalist romanticism was very effective in, in Italy. So this is uh, Garibaldi with his injury in the Aspromonte Mountains of, of Southern Italy. This is after the Sicilian campaign. There he is with some of his red shirts being carried on his litter through the mountains. Uh, by uh, Girolamo Induno, uh, and the great man himself. Ever notice that the, the, the great romantic statue of uh, Garibaldi in Washington Square Park on the uh, east side of the park? Anyhow, on to the, another new nation. Uh, Deutschland, Germania. So, from 1815 to 1848, what do we have? The Holy Roman Empire, dissolved by Napoleon in 1806, and a loose German federation set up by treaty in 1815. They could never go back, once broken, they could never go back to the Holy Roman Empire. Vigorous growth of German nationalism, because it's based on a shared language, literature, and culture, German was a much more dominant, centralized cultural language by that point than Italian was. That you, one could argue that there was a Hochdeutsch as early as the mid 18th century with a vibrant literature, with philosophers writing in the language and, and and novelists, famous novelists and poets, Schiller, Goethe writing in the language, operas being written in the language. Uh, there were liberal Republican idea, ideals. You had young Germany, Junges Deutschland, and that helped dissolve any links to the Habsburg past. But increasing industrial, 
industrialization shows the advantages of economic unity to Prussia and the German Confederation. So, as by 1848, since parts of Germany were beginning to industrialize, and you had apostles for economic unity for the first EU, in effect, uh, like List, uh, arguing for it, the advantages to, to people, the leadership in particularly in Prussia and the German Federation, Confederation, if not to the Austrians, uh, began to have appeal. So the idea of certain reform met the goal of unification in the middle. So you had these two forces bearing in from two different sides. In 1848, liberal uprisings uh, demand constitutional reform and lead to the short-lived and ultimately ineffective Frankfurt Parliament. There's a parliament of the German Confederation that is very weak and can get nothing done. A crown, they offer a crown to the conservative King Frederick William of Prussia, who refuses it. He's a conservative, he didn't see it going anywhere. Uh, so unification in, in Germany, uh, which was a goal as early as 1848, remains in limbo as Germany is pulled between nationalistic Prussia on one side and reactionary Austria on the other side. So, um, and, I, and I mentioned down here by the 1860s, Prussian power and influence uh, grow under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck. Um, and here he is with the full mustache. Next slide, please. Let me just look at this map. So we have the Russians over here. Uh, you, you realize that I'm calling parts of what are now Poland, Russia. I mean, this is Poland over here, but it, it's, and this is Poland over there. But some of it was in Prussia and some of it was under Russian control. Western Prussia, uh, including Berlin, including lots of what we would have called East Germany back when, uh, down through Silesia, uh, the Czech Bohemia and the Czech Republic on the Austrian side of the border. Uh, and then all these little German states, Saxony and Mecklenburg and Hanover and Hesse and Holstein, and the 17th century, there were like 200 of them. Some of them had banded together by this point. These are the large controlling groups. Uh, Oldenburg, Schleswig-Holstein, Württemberg, Hohenzollern, Bavaria, etc. All the way past the Rhine to the Belgian border and to the part Alsace-Lorraine uh, and the part that's disputed with France. Uh, and becomes one of the pretexts for the war with the French in 1870. And we're going to see that Prussia in 1865 begins to make successful annexations up here, that darker, the darker orangey color, and then gets joined by elements of the German Confederation in 1867. Saxons and Mecklenburgers. And then uh, after the successes of German uh, Prussia and France, uh, the Southern German states opt in. And then Alsace-Lorraine is part of the, the conquest um, of the French. And so by the time you get to 1871, that outer red line is, is uh, Germany, Deutschland. And it is still called in this period Klein Deutschland, Little Deutschland, because there were still elements of German speakers, particularly here in the Austrian Empire that were in what is now Austria and in what is now Czechoslovakia, uh, 
that were not part of the Union. And that's why in the 20th century, Hitler was able to argue for a Großdeutschland instead of a Kleindeutschland. Anyhow, on we go. So German unification takes place. Uh, I'll try to sum it up quickly. If you have other stuff to look at. Uh, under Bismarck's leadership and his principle of realpolitik, power politics, his idea, and a famous quote of his, the, the blood and iron, which is actually in the phrase iron and blood, but in his great blood and iron speech, quote, the great questions of the time will not be resolved by speeches and majority decisions. That was the great mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by iron and blood. You want to know how unification will take place? By the sword. Bismarck then, who is the diplomatist of all diplomatists, manage and a, a kind of a genius, he provokes three wars in a seven-year period, and he provokes wars that he knew he could easily win, and then he wins them. And in each case, it's the other side that declares war through his provocation. So because of an argument over with Denmark over Schleswig-Holstein, he provokes the Danes uh, and is able in 1864 to annex that part of Northern Germany. Uh, he provokes a war with Austria, maneuvering for unification under terms favorable to Prussia. Bismarck forces Austria into an unwinnable war. And it was because of that unwinnable war that they, the Austrians had to give up the claims to the Veneto in Italy. And then over uh, Alsace-Lorraine, he provokes, he diplomatically outmaneuvers Napoleon, the, uh, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, into declaring war. And in the Franco-Prussian War, he annexes uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And, and here in this picture, famous uh, painting, we have the emperor uh, Bismarck down there, the proclamation of the German empire, of where of all places? At the palace of Versailles. And it's the German successes of this war and the humiliating defeat of the French army that, that caused the French under the banner of revenge, revanche, the revanches, uh, to prime the pump for World War I. And, and so the 20th century will ensue in due course. While we have Bismarck on screen, I want to point out that not only was capital investment government-sponsored, in the German states in mid-century, mid-19th century. But Bismarck understood very well that he could outflank socialists militating for revolution by creating what came to be the welfare state. It's Bismarck who invents the idea of pensions for retirees, national pension plans. It's Bismarck who creates health insurance for workers. Give, another Bismarck quote, give the working man the right to work as long as he is healthy, assure him care when he is sick, assure him maintenance when he is old. The thronging to them, the socialists, will cease as soon as working men see that the government and legislative bodies are earnestly concerned for their welfare uh, in several ways. Uh, one of the great geniuses of the 19th century. And so nationalism and industrialization 
both contribute to the model of the modern nation state. And, and we're going to have a lot more to say about the development of welfareism in the nation state in the last half hour that we have here. Uh, because what I want to talk about as our final topic is how these developments spawned industrialization, the Industrial Revolution and urbanization and industrialization created conditions, social conditions that screamed for the development of new social sciences. Okay, it was the conditions themselves, society, social relations, social science. Industrialization forced changes in where people were located, in occupation, how they worked, in social status, and in social identity. The material and psychological changes were substantial. The question of who are people and what is human nature were completely open in a new and radical way. There was no fallback onto the usual examples I'm, the, I'm Ned, the peasant who lives down by the water mill anymore, uh, who goes to the, the, the church next to the, the cemetery on, 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 the, on the commons uh, every Sunday morning. Nothing was set anymore. People found themselves living in radically different environments, uh, sometimes in mass poverty, sometimes in new occupations, sometimes... They were, they were uh, nomadic and on the road and following their jobs where they moved. Their, their status and identity was probably set by occupation or by their becoming members of this new proletarian class. You had these new social groupings, nationalist and utopian movements, revolutionary parties, trade unions, societies for the emancipation of of slaves and for women's liberation. New, new places of saying, here is how I group. Here are my people. Here are the ones I like to go to meetings with. Here are the people I like to talk to. Here are the, the, the people in my social networks. Here are the people in my new Facebook groups. Here are my people. New political and economic theories were about groups. So suddenly, political theory, which had been in the great Anglo tradition, had largely been about property and individuals as suddenly being shifted to theories about groups, group behavior, group entity. You remember Mrs. Thatcher's uh, great remark as she tried to hold back the tide of the last two centuries? There is no such thing as society. A, a possessive individualist to the end. But the 19th century knew the lie to that. Based on the long tradition from Locke to Smith to John Stuart Mill, liberal Politico-economic theory had been anchored to the idea of the individual as a social atom. All rights, all values, all desirable outcomes were based on the individual free and informed choices in the state of nature. Marx and his fellow socialists had turned that concept on its head. Man was seen as a member of a social class whose destiny would be determined by group choices and actions. Human activity could only make sense when understood as a group activity. Now, along with this, new theories aspired now, not just to be political theories in the air, im Luft, as they say, but to be verifiable, to be scientific. Marx claimed his theory was a science of history. 
by which he meant a science of the evolution of society. By 1858, Darwin, this picture, I don't care what the topic is, if the topic touches on the 19th century, you need this man's picture smack dab in the middle of it. By 1858, Darwin's On the Origin of Species had landed like a thunderbolt with the claim that natural selection was scientific, scientifically verifiable. The social welfare reforms in public health, in labor conditions and education, encourage science-based studies for implementation. Remember how we ended the last session when I gave you that list of English social reforms that took place between the 1830s and 1870s? Well, a lot of them were studies that were looking into public health problems, labor condition problems, problems in education and and, and the requirements for educational reform. And they reported to be, purported to be scientifically based. They were studies. A science of society was required. And so we have the birth of sociology in our period. Uh, Not arbitrary, just because all social conditions were screaming for ways of wrapping science's hands around what was going on. And and the earliest significant major theorist of this, who read by everybody, including Marx, was uh, Auguste Comte, still born in the late 18th century. He makes it 1857. He's a disciple, remember, uh, the Comte de Saint-Simon with his with his industrial socialism, uh, society should be in the hands of social planners. And he was a disciple of that and regarded uh, himself as the father of modern sociology. He authors a very influential text all through the uh, 19th century called The Course of Positive Philosophy, Positivism, as it was known. And he develops two major theories. One is the law of the three stages. Uh, as he argued, a universal theory of necessary necessary historical evolution. He thought this is what happens if you look at society. Uh, at, you know, keep it, look at it up close under the microscope, but hold it out so you can see the whole panoply of history passing before you and can understand the big picture. Number one, there's always a theological stage. And in that stage, the mode of thinking uh, that characterizes it um, is theological. And it precedes enlightenment rationalism. Uh, And he would, he's looking at Western theory, but he would say, uh, at any stage in world history, if you look at it, this is what you see. Then there is a period of what he calls a metaphysical stage it's, it's characterized by rationalist investigation, but it's still not quite empirical. So he would see the 18th century enlightenment figures, the philosophes and Adam Smith and those people as introducing rationalist explanations that still did not have what they needed to, to, to do scientific studies of development. And then finally, there is the so-called positive stage Empirical science is the major characteristic. And because of his interest in dialectical history, Marx noted and rejected Comte as another expression of idealist thought. But but the idea that there was a dialectic in Comte is something that that Marx uh, was influenced by. And then his other great contribution was that he classified the sciences, this is his classification over here, in a way that featured the the unity, the interrelationship, the interdependency of all the sciences and their order of historical development. So he wants to argue that historically, top to bottom, Mathematics, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, and then sociology 
And you can think of um, Pythagoreans and then Greek and, and, and astronomy, and then the development of early physics and chemistry, uh, biology, and he would have, uh, had he lived another two years, he would say, ah, see how Charles Darwin fits in this very recent development. And he would say, and then sociology. And the movement is also from the most general to the most particular, from the simplest to the most complex. That, that, that social uh, data is so complex and voluminous that, that it, it, it almost moves into a special class of its own. But social phenomena had been considered too complex to support a science. He wants to argue that it's now time for a new science. And for comp sociology is encyclopedic. That is, it coordinates the development of the whole of knowledge. So that as you understand all of society, you understand where everything fits. The social world is complex. And here is the fundamental, the fundamental reason I suggest the significance of the development of modern sociology uh, as earth shattering a concept. Not only does it hope to be able to understand the complex, the suggestion is that if it can, that complexity is modifiable. You actually can control the history of the world, if you can understand that complexity that is historical and social development. Social science gives man control of its future. Uh, think about all the texts being written about the future of artificial intelligence as we speak. I don't want to go there right now, but worth the thought. The concept of building a social technology so appealed to the minds of social reformers that John Stuart Mill wrote a book called, remember I said he wrote a shelf of books in the last session, August Comte and Positivism in 1865. He noticed the value of it out of the gate. And the, another step in the birth of sociology. Herbert Spencer, a man of one generation later, psychologist, biologist, philosopher, probably the most popular and heavily published intellectual of the 19th century, uh, perhaps with the exception of Darwin. After reading Darwin, he wrote a very influential book called Principles of Biology, in which he coined the term survival of the fittest. This is the guy who invented what came to be known, and the term itself, social Darwinism, uh, which didn't do favors to the, uh, the poor or anybody who was in the social, an inferior social position in the world. Uh, he argued for social evolution, his theory that evolutionary development extended to the mind, culture, and society came to be known as social Darwinism. It was often used to justify uh, the colonial empires that the European countries were building at the time, uh, who wanted to look at uh, Asian and African societies as socially inferior, lower on the Darwinian scale. Everything in the universe, including mind, culture, language, and morality could be explained by evolutionary science. Evolutionary progress always moves from the simple to the complex and would achieve an endpoint and human social perfection was an argument he tries to make. He became notorious for his challenge to traditional religions belief that human nature was beyond the scope of scientific explanation. Remember, in, in, in a religious explanation, not only is God and the universe set in place, but the but man, human nature, 
is a set single act of creation. It's a fixity. It's um, a, it's a singleton. And and here's somebody saying, oh no no no. Uh, not only are humans evolved, but the culture that they spawn is itself evolving and evolving with them and making them evolve all, all simultaneously. So, uh, social science, progress and evolution, the theories of Kump, Spencer, and Marx all shared what was a novel but now commonplace assumption that human social development is a valid subject of scientific inquiry and that the future of society would benefit from this inquiry. And I include a quote from uh, the great intellectual historian uh, from Oxford, the 20th century historian, Isaiah Berlin. The sociological treatment of historical and moral problems, which Comte and after him Spencer had discussed the map became a precise and concrete study only when the attack of militant Marxism made its conclusions a burning issue and so made the search for evidence more zealous and the attention to method more intense. So, so Marx and the threat of radical socialism suddenly became the impetus for uh, liberal theorists to adopt social science positions to make cases for what was going on with the social unit writ large and looked at historically. And then in a, in a final comment on the development of social science, I decided to refer to somebody who you may never have heard of, but is, is really a kind of a giant. Um, Adolf Ketele, a French astronomer, again, born late 18th century, lives 1874, astronomer, mathematician, statistician. He was a pioneer in the application of statistics to social science, planning what he called social physics. And let's look at his social physics. Social phenomena are immensely complex and depend on a host of measurable variables. This complexity can only be expressed in terms of probability and probability theory and so required the application of statistical methods out of which, if you think of the 20th and 21st century, comes everything, particle physics, demographics, all sociological theory, everything is about probabilistic modeling. And here is perhaps the man who first saw it. Think of the, the implications of, of artificial intelligence using probabilistic modeling with tremendous powers of statistical um, you know, calculation capability that has been unleashed. And we're, we're at the beginning of in the early 21st century. Ketelet promoted the, th think of it in medicine. Think of the impact this has had. Ketelet promoted the use of statistics to questions of crime rates, marriage rates, suicide rates. His method, controversial at the time, attempted to correlate variables to other social factors, for example, poverty. So out of the blue, he's doing a study of crime and he notices that there are correlations to social class and poverty, which hadn't been formally linked, but he's got statistical evidence of the correlation. And, and it's absolutely revolutionary. This raised the very modern question of free will versus social determinism, which is still with us. And uh, 
I decide to throw a little learn, Leonard Bernstein in for your consumption. Hey, I'm depraved on account I'm deprived. If you remember the G. Officer Krupke song from West Side Story. Uh, I'm born in poverty. That's why I'm a bad boy. That's why I'm a delinquent. So the mid to late 19th century witnessed an explosion of studies related to the social concerns raised by the displacements of industrialization and by the political demands for social equity that came in their wake. Poverty, immigration, crime, family support, public health, children's education were studied, they were dissected, they were argued, and sometimes they were even incrementally addressed in the 19th century. The age of the technocratic and occasionally paternalistic modern nation state was born. So if you wonder why every nation state in the world as we speak is in some fashion a paternalistic welfare state, including the most market-driven capitalist entities like the United States, which is still a heavy welfare democracy, right down to extreme cases of paternalistic state uh, control like China. You're just talking about uh, different places along a common and, and same spectrum. So a few nods to society and art, uh, realism in art, the romantic pastoral gives way to a hard look at work society and the plight of workers. So here we have haymaking, 1877, Jules Bastien Lepage, uh, rural wage laborers, not the people who own the farm, with its depiction of stunned exhaustion. And it created in the salon that it was first shown at quite a sensation because it was not idealized, it was not romanticized. Here they are. Let's take a look at society in a, in a kind of realistic way. In opera, Barismo, the, 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 the truthful, realistic look at social conditions. Uh, all art forms reflect a new social reality, some sooner than others. Literature produced new voices ranging from the naturalism of Flaubert to the social realism of Zola, if you just think of Nana, for instance, uh, Germinal. In opera, Verismo composers in the 1880s, 90s will focus on common people and gritty realities. You have you know, the Ashcan school of painting that will come to the fore uh, a little later in our period. Social issues are rendered. Here's a depiction of a family making its way to the next job opportunity. Uh, these are not people on welfare. He's got his tools. It's not sentimentalized. The new social reality has displacement built in. The family is homeless. Not destitute. The guy's got his tools in place. Uh, by the late 19th century, the argument will be made by some that art should have a social utility and be an agent for change, for cultural change. Uh, the great arguments of ars gratia artis, art for the sake of art, or art for a social purpose, will come to the fore in this later period. Our last picture, um, lots of renditions of labor. I just picked one, uh, a strike. Factories in the background, the capitalist in his top hat. Uh, the class is somebody's going to pick up a rock and heave it at somebody or a tomato or something or other. Uh, everything's here. The displaced workers, people out of work, people who aren't making enough the factories in full steam, uh, the, the, the disparities in wealth, 
took it from a slightly later painting, but you get the point. And then in the last slide, what I have here is actually the first slide that we had in the first session. I've grayed out the background. Remember, we had talked about first what was pre-industrial society and what happened in the 18th century disruption. And then I looked at what we were going to discover in the class. And I, and I wanted to just reemphasize these. What do we see between 1789 and 1870? We see class consciousness and political revolution. We see radical new theories of human nature, economics, society, and history. We see nationalist and ethnic identification to fill the void that had been created by the, the loss of community, of traditionalist community. And we see, and, and, and this last line, actually, I changed from the first slide. I threw in one more word. On the first slide, it says creation of nation states. Yes, but creation of modern nation states as well as new nation states. And whoops, let me go back to that. Um, so, so we have um, the welfare state as well as new ethnic states. We have a new Italy, we have a new Germany, and we have the 20th century about to, to bear down on us. And instead, Stop the share. I am going to cancel my spotlight and go back into here. And if, if anybody's got questions or observations, um, feel free to unmute yourselves or set up a, a chat comment whatever you have, but- That line, that line about um, Officer Krupke was written by Stephen Sondheim. Not ah. Sondheim, right? <laughs> Correct, <laughs> thank you. He just wrote the music. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I'm a music guy. Operas for me were always written by the composer, not the lyricist. <laughs> it's Mozart, it's not that other guy, come on. <laughs> <laughs> He's got enough recognition, Stephen Sondheim, you're right. <laughs> uh, Anyhow, thank you. For, thank you. For I think you caught, somebody, us, you caught us by surprise on that. I wasn't expecting Officer Krupski at that point. Krup, Krupski, right. <laughs> like, so, oh Lou, God. with all this talk of revolution, are we setting up for a revolution in this country? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somehow I think it'll not end with a bang, but a whimper. <sighs> you know, if I can steal the uh, T.S. Eliot line. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, um, I just, I mean, just your your, your perspective on it. Um, 1864 to 1870. I mean, Europe must have absolutely been stunned by what Germany pulled off because in like the, the Crimean War before that, 1848, and I think um, Prussia, no, excuse me, France and Austria were at war in like uh, 1859 in Italy. It was basically reheated. Napoleonic tactics, and there was a lot of incompetence. But what Bismarck pulled off in those three wars, I mean, Europe must have basically had its breath taken away and been stunned. Everyone thought that France had the best army in Europe. And That's in right. 1870, they just, I mean, they cleaned their clocks about anything. They also, they also thought they had the best army in 1914. <laughs> 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 the, the, the French have a, uh, a history of, 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 of good press and bad follow through, apparently. And, uh, and the, the genius of that, that he was able to position these nations so that they declared war on them. So it was like, we're not the aggressors. Hey, you declared war on us. We're just defending our interests and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly and, the case. And the exactly. Danish, who, who were they de declaring war on anyone? I, mean, I know, I know. Well, they make great detective series, the Danish. <laughs> So do you, do you see any parallels with what's going on today 
with the changes that happened in the, oh, let's say the 19th century. Um, Any parallels, anything, you, you see big changes caused by everything that's going on? <laughs> I can't even begin to enumerate everything that's going on. Well, well, well certainly, um, you know, I, I mean, I suppose the obvious parallel is around the rise of populism, even though it's under such a different set of conditions now. Um, it, it, I mean, it now focuses on immigrants from third world countries more than it does on a, if you will, developed ethnicity being occupied by a different developed ethnicity. You know, it isn't Hungarians and Germans, but you know, us and Mexicans are God knows what. Uh, I would say that what was the um, what was the Mark Twain line? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. <laughs> um, you. At best, you can you can inform your present thinking. I mean, I who who read a lot of history across lots of cultures and lots of periods because it's an old first love of mine. Um, find that nothing is a, is a direct parallel to anything else, but informs it, gives you ways of thinking about it that are useful. That, in other words, it, it gives texture to help the, about the way I think about the new situation or the new circumstance. But, but, but if I try, like, like something I find, you see it going on now all the time, the silliness of people doing election forecasting, they have a sample set over the last 80 years of 20 elections. Can you imagine doing a statistical analysis when your sample set is 20? And that's across a century of his, you know, 80 years of historical change. It's like, it's so silly to think of. Somebody says, oh, does the economy do better under the Republicans or the Democrats? And they're looking at, you know, four presidents or <laughs> something like that. I mean, I mean, it's. Uh, it's, but when, it's even, when even the Democrats weren't what today's Democrats are. Of course, of course, of course. Which is why that which is why, like I say, historical reference uh, can help you frame the way you think about what's going on now. But the idea of looking for predictors, as if that were scientific. That, the thing that Hedley's contribution of statistical analysis, I mean, the, the idea that, that for a physicist, reality are trillions and gazillions of subatomic events such that you can't ever really know what is going to happen that you can do your best probabilistically looking at trends um, is this immense contribution. Anyhow, go ahead. What about, what about you know, like in the 17th and 18th century, 18th century, 19th century, you had the dominance of white Europe over the rest of the world. And today in the United States, you see playing out and maybe in, in other nations too, France, Germany, England, that the white race or white nation is not all pervasive and it's beginning to break down. And they say in the United States by 2050, 60, there'll be no pure white population hardly. It'll be all mixed. Well, since, since there isn't, since race really isn't a verifiable construct to begin with, um, you know, we're all out of Africa. Um, 
what you wind up with is, is the great stew that the world is. I mean, we are this, we are this stew mix of certain percentages of Neanderthal genes and what have you. And although we've, we've tried to, to use nationalist traces like language and the like to categorize ourselves and each other, uh, it, it's too simplistic an analysis to make sense out of anything that's going on in the world anywhere at any time. I mean, we're all a little bit of everything. And if we wait 20 minutes, we're gonna be a little different. <laughs> and, and, and the stew will look a little bit different. You know, it's just- I've just read that what unifies a nation or what defines a nation is language. And I don't know where who's, whose idea that was, but I, I thought it was quite true until today in the United States when we are becoming bilingual, multilingual. Well, re rem remember the point that I made about nationalism earlier in this sequence of classes. And, and it was when I was talking about nationalism and romanticism as having influenced each other. The idea of the nation state and the idea of this group that we belong to and the idea of race for that matter are constructs that were invented more or less in the 19th century. They were invented because I believe of the perceived loss of identity that came with industrial displacement. That people wanted, you, you remember when Reagan was running on the morning in, in America mm. theme and whatever, what was that, 80 or 84? And, and you had the little rural farmstead with the cornfield in the background and the sun is coming up. Nobody I knew in the world had grown up with that. They, it was a construct. It's a myth that we sell ourselves to feel like we're part of something. And, and, and indeed, what we make up and the reason we fight each other and the reason people are buying AK-47s to go down to the polls or whatever the hell they're doing is because they want a narrative that makes sense of how they have been victimized, of how they have been shortchanged, of how they, 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 on the positive side, want to belong to something. Um, these are these are narratives that we make up and tell ourselves so that we feel better. And we do them, and 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 ironically, and and the big argument about Facebook and and social media that's being made on the right, on the left, everybody is arguing about its influence is that uh, the social constructs of social media tends to reinforce the idea of na narrative invention and myth making. So, so we get to develop these feedback vacuums and, and where all we listen to are, are people just like us telling us the narrative we want to hear. Which is kind of a regrowth of tribalism, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it, I keep it, reading it about is. tribalism now. It, it is, it is. Anyhow, Punchline of all that back in the day, everyone said the internet was going to give us such a multitude of various different forms of information coming in and we would become so much richer in terms of our knowledge. And instead, it's just had people focus themselves down to coming to, you know, just a pinprick in terms of where their information is coming from. The exact opposite of yeah. what we all thought was going to happen back in the day. I'm, I'm afraid you may be right. Anyhow. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank and you. And I, and I do want to mention to everyone that when the winter session comes around, which I believe is late January, I'm, I'm headed way back in time. I'm going to do 
an early medieval class uh, in that session. And then uh -oh. in the next spring section, I'm going to do a late medieval. Good. <laughs> That's good. So, <laughs> Great. So Thank there you, you go, gang. Thank, Thank you so much. Interested. Thank you. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Thank you.